This is task 1J. You are asked to create a user guide to show users how to do all of these things. You don't have to have completed the whole of task 1 in order to complete this user guide. You can show screenshots of that. To view the campus, you could just have a basic form based on campus and church and show how that is opened. To update the pitch prices, it's just about clicking a button that will update those prices, which again could be just a rectangle with text. And for the new booking processing, you could have a form that's similar to the view booking details, but you add some instructions on how to actually add a new booking. And then you'll need instructions on how to start the system, which you can just have any database file that has been created uh, stored in a sensible folder. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how to create a user guide and I'm going to have a look at it in more of a generic way of how to create any user guide for an access system. So I've got my document here and I'm going to give it a title of user guide and I'm just going to make sure that I haven't got any problems with the spacing because often Word in its normal dot dot template does mess up your paragraphs. So I'm just going to sort that out before we start. Reduce all these to zero. And we'll have single line spacing as well. There we go. Now you need certain things that must be included on the user guide. You have to have the title page. I'm going to create a new page here, control enter. And you need to have a contents page. We're then going to have an introduction, or it could be called an overview. You need to have software requirements. You need to have hardware requirements. You need to have instructions, a glossary, and a troubleshooting section. Sometimes people include an index, but there's quite a lot of work involved in an index. And the way that it works with OCI is that if you've included a contents page, you don't have to have an index as well. Now each of these are going to be in a style. So you need to look at what the house style is for the organisation you're producing the user guide for, and then set that style up for each of these items. So I'm going to change this to be 24 points, if it will let me. Uh, in Times New Roman, there it is, in bold and in red. And that is going to be my title style that I'm going to use for each of these main titles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up as what we call Heading 1. So I'm going to right hand click on Heading 1 and I'm going to update it so it matches what I've just done. That means now that whenever I make any of these Heading 1, like this, they will follow that pattern. Now what I can do is I can use the control key to do this a little bit quicker, as long as I'm accurate with my mouse and they're all now heading ones. Now, my contents page is going to be based upon the rest of the document. And I can insert an automated contents page. You can do this through references, and you'll see that there's an option here to include a table of contents. So I'm going to put that in, and you can just choose the first style. It doesn't matter which style you choose and it will put a table of contents in for you. I'm just going to delete that bit, and I'm also going to delete user guide and contents page. We will need to update this later. When you've finished, just right hand click, update field, and select the option to update the entire table. And that means if you put any extra subheadings in, particularly in the instructions section, then those will be included. But don't forget, when you do that, to delete the bits that you don't need repeated in there. Our introduction just needs to be a paragraph about what the user guide is going to do. Well, I could just do this and say this user guide will show the user how to start the system, use the menu, view campus, update the pitch prices, to premium prices, create a new booking, and that would be sufficient. Our software requirements, well, we need to think about what software have we used um, for this system. Well, I've used Microsoft Access 13, that is needed to run it. And in order to use Microsoft Access 2013, I'm going to need a version of Windows. Well, the version of Windows I've got installed on this system is Windows 8. 
but I know that 2013 will run on Windows 7. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change these again to my house style. Uh, in this case the house style I'm using is Times New Roman and 12 and I'm going to make this my normal font. So I'm going to update normal to match this selection so that it will follow that pattern. Now what I need to do now is find out what hardware is needed to run Microsoft Access 2013 and also Windows 7. And I also need to think about what else might I need for this system. In this particular case, the example that I've done, uh, where I've done a user guide for a booking system, uh, and it's just going to be about starting the system using a menu. One of the options is where we're updating the pitch prices, that also prints out a report. So we're going to need a printer. And I don't need to have anything fancy, so I'm just going to put a printer capable of printing A4 pages. And that will be absolutely sufficient. I don't need to specify the exact type of printer and whether it's inkjet and whether it's a laser printer. So we'll move on now and have a look. How do we find out about what's needed for Microsoft Access 2013? Well, if you go onto the web and you just search for Microsoft Access 2013 hardware requirements, you'll find a list of them there. We'll just wait for it to catch up with us. And there we go. Usually the best ones are what you'll find on the actual office site itself and here's the hardware so we can just list a few of these things so one gigabyte of RAM we've already got Windows 7 three gigabytes of disk space and a monitor resolution of 1024 by 768 so we'll put that in so monitor 1024 by 768 RAM one gigabyte uh, spare disk space Three gigabytes. Now in addition to this we need to think about Windows as well. So if we're using Windows 7 and we've recommended Windows 7 be used then we also need to find the Windows 7 hardware requirements. So we'll put that in and what we need to do is look at the combined requirements that we're likely to need. So oh, it actually came up in that uh, little pop-up there didn't it but we'll have a look at what comes up here. So we need a one gigahertz processor and one gigabyte of RAM. So let's go back here. So we'll change our RAM to two gigabytes. Uh, we need a one gigahertz processor. Uh, we need 16 gigabytes of available hard disk space. So we'll now change this to 19 gigabytes. And we need a Direct9 Direct X9 graphics. So we'll put that as well. There we go, there's our hardware requirements. Let's think about other things we might need. A mouse is gonna be useful and a keyboard as well because we haven't included those things. So we can now move on to write our instructions. Now our instructions, we need to look at what we're asked to do. In the example that I'm using, we're told us how to start the system. Now the easiest way of including how to start a system is to have an icon on the desktop. And then all you've got to do is do a screenshot of that icon on the desktop Take that screenshot, paste it in here, and say, open the name of the file, Sutton Park Revival Festival, from the desktop. It's important that you say where it's gonna be opened from. But if you're opening it from a folder location, that's absolutely fine as well. So I could take a screenshot of this, and I could say where you need to go to get that. So I would need to say exactly where it's going to be. So open that file from my documents and then I've got to say where it's going to go next. So my documents backslash and it might be Sutton Park. But you've got to be specific about where it's going to go. Now this is going to have a subtitle for open the file. Okay, and we need to put this into our heading two style. Well the heading two style I'm going to use is going to be underlined 14 points times new roman in red so i'll update that to be my heading two so that then when i do my next bit so using the menu i can just set that to be a heading two style straight away and now all i've got to do is take a screenshot of the menu and explain how that is used i can use arrows as well so we can insert here 
use shapes and I can put an arrow in. You might find that arrow is not clear enough, that's fine, you can make it thicker, you can do whatever you want. You might also find that it's useful to use automated numbering. This is because it makes it clear to the user exactly what in, um, order the instructions need to be followed in. Finally, make sure that you check your spelling as you go through. Now the glossary section is going to be a list of terms that have been used throughout the user guide or are relevant within the software. They mustn't be things that are irrelevant. We're not talking about paper jams, for example, paper jam is. Now an easy way of doing a glossary is to have two columns and use at least eight terms. Okay, so I'm going to think about well, what might be a term that's used in this software, well, for example, premium prices is something. And I explain here what a premium price is. Uh, we might have things that are specific to the software itself, like a record. Uh, we might be using a form. We're probably not going to be mentioning anything about relationships because our user guide is for the user and the user doesn't need to know anything about relationships. They're probably not going to know anything about tables either, nor queries. Um, or macros because everything's going to be done through a menu. So we just focus on the things that they need to be aware of. Validation might be something that pops up and so that might be appropriate to be included here as well. When you've done that, sort them into order. So if you go to layout, you'll be able to sort them into alphabetical order. Now the troubleshooting section should have three, uh, and it's about common errors. So what you're going to do is you'll have the sort of problem that might happen, what might have caused, and what could be a potential solution. Now, a good problem to have is when you get an error from a validation message. So you can screenshot an error from a validation message into here, say what has caused it, so the, it might be that there weren't enough spaces left uh, for watching a cinema, or it might not be enough uh, pitches left for a campsite. So say what's caused it, why that's happened, and then explain what the solution might be. So the solution might be to, well, you'll have to update the entire table. And you can see now that the subtitles have come in. I haven't put all of them in there, but we need to take those top two things out. All the numbers have updated themselves, and now my user guide is ready to save and print off. So that's the end of that. You'll need to work out exactly what the instructions are that are going to go into the user guide. Do have a look at the similar but different task answers and you can then think about, well, that's the sort of way that a user guide is written. I'm now going to follow that style for the user guide in my real coursework as well.